We started with this a couple of weeks back and just going to go through the. Basically, I'm barely going to get out of the third chapter of James, so <laughs> we'll finish up next week. But today is um, today and next week are a couple of the passages of James that I think really kind of they kind of get right up in our faces. This one in particular, it starts out with a question: What good is it? And then it goes on to talk about faith <coughs> without works. You know, I got a picture up there of, of some fruit hanging on a tree. And every time I hear that, every time I read this passage, he talks about our works, our, our way of doing things, but I think about trees and fruitfulness. When we first moved into our parsonage up in, in Hazen, North Dakota, or not Hazen, in Steele, um, we had some little trees out behind the parsonage. <coughs> And me, being the Greek horticulturist that I am, said, those are trees. <laughs> and my wife said, yeah, there's an apple tree, and that's an apple tree, and that's a maple. And I said, okay, whatever. You, you say it, I believe it, because I don't know. I can recognize a maple tree because I know what a maple leaf looks like. But if there's a leaf on it, I wouldn't have a clue. And so as I, as I looked at these trees, I thought, okay, apple trees. I like apples. That would be great. So the first year that we were there, I uh, came home one day from doing sure, something, yeah. and Hazel said, oh, you want to have some of, the, uh, some of the fruit of our apple trees? I said, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And she handed me a apple, an apple. That was it. That's what those two trees produced that year, one apple. <laughs> one. And the next year wasn't a heck of a lot better. We tripled, though. We had three. And they were little dumb apples. They didn't taste good. I couldn't see what good they were other than the birds and, you know, rabbits and things might like them. But the next year, we had so many apples on two little trees that I could reach up and pick the apples off the top of. I mean, these are little trees. We had about 10 pounds worth of apples out of those two trees. They figured out what it was they were supposed to do. They were supposed to grow apples, right? And that's how you tell if an apple tree or a peach tree or a grapefruit tree or whatever is worthy of being planted <coughs> is if it produces fruit. And a tree that's supposed to produce fruit and doesn't really doesn't have a lot of value. Especially if it's just one tree. It won't even block much wind. You know, it's not going to stop a lot of snow. The, the proof of a fruit tree is in the fruit that it produces. James is saying to us, the proof of our faith is in the fruit that it produces. Um, what good is it, he says, if you have faith, but no deeds, what good is it? What good is it to, for you to say, well, I, I believe in God, and, and um, you know, that's important to me, and I, I trust that God is the only God? And I love his answer. Good. Even the demons believe that. But it makes them terrified. It doesn't seem to affect you. Faith is an important thing. But faith without works, James would contend, is death. Is dead. It's nothing. Faith without works. Now, I think I said this as I began. Martin Luther didn't like the book of James. Because he said it was opposite to the teachings of Paul, where Paul said we are we're saved by faith alone and not by works. The problem is that he didn't really read it the right way because Paul was talking about the works of the law. And Jesus himself railed against the works of the law, these things that the, that the priests and the rabbis had said, this is what you need to do in order to prove that you have faith. You need to wash your hands the right way, you need to observe all of these Sabbath laws, you need to do all of these 
those things, those are the things you have to do or you don't have faith. And in their mind, you got the faith by doing the things. If you uh, kept the Sabbath well enough, if you did all of the things that the law said well enough, then you would get faith. But that's not what Paul was saying. What Paul was saying is that faith is what is in us, and these rules that the rabbis and the, and the priests and the Levites have put together, those are just that. They're just rules. James comes along and says, that's right. But we can't just say, I have faith, and never let it change us. Faith, when it comes into us, makes a difference, or it isn't really faith. It changes who we are. His example is wonderful. Uh, I want to read it to you, though, from another translation. Uh, when, when I study these scriptures, I, I usually pick three or four different translations and read through them, because sometimes they say it differently, and it's easier to understand. So this is from uh, a translation called The Message uh, by Eugene Peterson, a pastor and a theologian. And it's written, well, in a little different language. It goes like this. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this life, anywhere in this, if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved, and you say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? To? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts? It's outrageous nonsense. I like the way he wrote that. You know, faith in deeds is, is biblical language, and, and we kind of understand that. But Peterson really put it right. God talk without God action is pointless. What would Jesus have done? You know, we used to wear those little bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Jesus came upon someone half starved and in ragged clothes. The first thing he would do is find them some clothes and get them something to eat. And then he would say, God bless you, go on your way and be blessed by God. Make sure that your actions match your words. You tell someone, God bless you, but do nothing to let them see God's blessings. You really don't have the faith that James is talking about. The faith that's a living faith. The faith that Let's people see it by the way you live, by the way you react and treat other people. It's just, it's just a hard thing. Because when people look at this, they think, oh, that means I have to go and do all of this, and I have to go do that, and I have to. No, no, it's not have to. It has nothing to do with have to as far as, like, it's a rule, and if I don't do it, somebody's going to yell at me out of have to. It's a have to because if Christ lives in my heart, if I have truly accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have to do it because that's the only reaction that I could possibly have. It isn't that I do it out of fear of retribution, out of fear of punishment. I do it because that's just who I am and that's just how I react in those kinds of situations. That's what James is talking about. He's talking about having Christ so fill us and so dwell in us that we can't help but act the way Christ would act. And that's a different deal than this is the rule I need to obey it. And we all understand rules. You know, we've got rules. And most of the rules have a good reason behind them, but in, in faith, there's one rule, and only one. And it, it may sound trite, but really it is. What would Jesus do? How would 
Jesus treat this person or treat this situation? How would Jesus react in this same place that I'm in right now? How would Jesus respond to anything? That's the rule. That's the only rule of being a Christian is to try to our limited human ability to do what Jesus would do and to live in that way. And James is adamant about it. It's, it's not a choice that we, that we get to do. It's just if he's in us, then he shows through us. So it goes on and, and it says, I can already hear one of you saying, well, that sounds good. Uh, you take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. No, not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, work and faith, they fit together like hand and glove. They are, they're the same. You know, what is it, horse and carriage? You love and marriage, you go together like a horse and carriage, you can't have one without the other. You really can't. If you're doing works without faith, then you're just going through the motions. But if you have faith without doing anything, then James would say, I don't honestly believe you really have faith. You need to grow some. You need to learn more about what faith means, and you need to truly let Christ live in you. And when it gets right down to it, friends, that's, that's the key. Does Jesus dwell in your heart? Have you been changed because of that? If you haven't, then maybe you need to look at whether he's really there in your heart and, and try a little harder to just open up your heart and let him come in. You know, we, we have that passage that says, I stand at the door and I knock. Because Jesus doesn't break in. He waits to be welcomed in. And when he does come in, it says, I'll sit down and I'll eat with you and I'll sup with you, I'll be with you. He will dwell in you and me. We need to open the door. We need to let him come in and change us. And that's the hard part. Letting him change us. Because, honestly, most of us don't want to be changed. And change is one of those things that always happens. Anybody that farms know that changes happen. You put a seed in the ground, and if that seed doesn't change into a plant, you've wasted all of your time. It changes, and it changes dramatically. It doesn't look like what you put in the ground. It doesn't look the same. When we let that seed of Christ, his love, dwell in us, it changes us too. And we don't look the same. We're no longer the same people we were. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And if we are a new creation in Christ Jesus, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that all of a sudden your hair changes color or you get taller or you get shorter or you get thinner or whatever. It means that somehow or another Jesus starts to shine out of your heart. That's why I love that little song in the beginning. When I first learned that song, the only thing I learned was that first verse, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. But James would say without the second verse, it's useless. Because the second verse says, shine out of my heart. Shine out of my heart, Lord Jesus. We take him into our heart, and that's great. But we don't hold him there. We don't hide him. You know, it's a song, don't hide your light under the bushel. Don't let it shine all over. Yeah. That's what we do. Jesus changes us. And if he doesn't, then we need to think about trying to open our heart just a little bit more and let him come in. Because he will change you. He will make you into a new person. And that new person is the kind of person that James will look at and say, and that's the person that recognizes their neighbors in need, that recognizes the people that have problems, 
And did you notice this? It's not, it's not, oh, well, there's somebody off over in another country that's starving and I need to do this. No, he's talking about right here at home, your friend. That's why I like Peterson's translation. You see an old friend. You see somebody you've known for years and you see all of a sudden something terrible has happened. And you don't help. It starts at home. And it stands beyond because Christ... Christ said to his disciples when he left, go into all of the world. But he also said, start where you are, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Not get out to the ends of the earth and that's where you go. Start where you are. And let Jesus shine on you. Let Jesus live in your heart. And let him change who you are. What good is it? If we did that, this world would change in an instant. If we could all let Christ live in our hearts and let him shine out of our hearts, if we would let that change happen in us, the good that it could make in this world is unimaginable. And I think I could get no disagreement that we live in a world that needs change, that needs to be changed. But have you noticed? The changes always start small and grow. In the parable of the sower and the seed, it says, you know, he plants the seed and, and it grows 30, 60, 100 fold. The little seed grows plants far larger than it ever was. A change in us can make a change in this world far larger than any change we can imagine. What good is it? You know, a few years back, <clears throat> the district superintendents were going around and they were asking these questions, you know, uh, and I don't have them in order. I should have grabbed, grabbed a little card and brought it out, but it said, why do people need the church? Why do people need our church? And then they flipped the card over on the other side, it was so that. When I was in seminary, our professor always said, every sermon needs to have a so what. That's the way you like to put it. So now that you've heard this what, now what? Well, we need to let Christ in our heart. We need to let him change us. And the so what is, so the world can be changed. So that people who are hurting are no longer hurting. So the people who are hungry are no longer hungry. So people that are frightened and afraid are not anymore. So people that are bullied and, and looked down on and said bad things about are not having those things happen to them. So people will feel the love of Jesus Christ. Because that love, the perfect love of Christ passed out all fear. And when that love lives in you, you will change the world. When that love lives in you, you will change yourself. And everyone will see it. The early Christians were noticed by the people around them. Not because they had fancy buildings, not because they had a really good choir or a great organ player, piano player, not because of any of those reasons. You know the reason they were noticed? Secular writers from the time said these followers of the way, see how they love one another. They loved each other, and here's the kicker. They even loved the people that hated them. They loved everyone. Not because everyone deserved love, not because everyone was lovable, but because Christ first loved them. And that love dwelt inside of them so much that they couldn't hold it in. There's a story about a pastor doing a, a children's sermon one Sunday and, and he finished up the sermon to the kids by saying you need to let Jesus come inside of you and live inside of you. 
And one little girl had this puzzled look on her face, and she kept looking at this picture of Jesus with the sheep that was on the wall of the church. And she looked at that and looked at that, and finally she looked at the pastor and she said, but he's so big, if he lived in me, he'd spill out. <laughs> out of the mouths of babes. That's why I like children's church songs. Because you know it's not hard. <laughs> Christianity is pretty simple. It really is. Let Jesus live in you and spill out of you. That's it. In a nutshell. If we can do that, friends, people will say, those folks over there at that United Methodist Church, see how they love each other and everyone? What a wonderful thing to have anybody say about anybody. See how they love. Love shows itself, not just in words, but in actions, in deeds, in the way that we treat one another, in the way we respond to one another. Sure, we're going to mess up. That, there's no doubt about that because we're, we're fallen humans, and we will mess up. But you know what? We can always, always ask God's forgiveness and start over and say, yeah, I blew it, but I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to do the best I can to let Jesus spill out of me. So what good is it? It's all the good in the world if Christ can live inside of you and spill out of you. And we'll see your faith. And so will the world. And then, then, we can see God's kingdom come on this earth, and we can be a part of it. What a blessing that is, and what a joy it will be to let Christ spill out of us. So that all the world, all of the world, gets a little bit of Christ on them because it's spilled out of us. What a great blessing that will be. Let him live in your heart, and let it be seen in the way that you live.